Give yourself a quick round of applause. You made it to the last session of the conference on a Friday. We're happy you're here, definitely. Um, this is the uh, Cloud Native Data getting to the X factors, which is like not like the TV show, the X factor or something. Um, it's more like a fill in the blank, we don't know what the variable is, X, uh, use of that. Um, and so uh, I have to quickly provide some information about uh, the fact that if in the event of a fire, we should all try to leave the building. <laughs> the URL for the public who? Public concourse, oh, I know, and searching this got me really confused with, you know, like concourse, concourse. Um, okay, so uh, we're just gonna jump right into it. I first wanna let each of the panelists, you can find their, uh, their information and their Twitter handles here if you're uh, of the spirit to live tweet these sorts of things. Um, so, why don't each of you introduce yourself a little bit and also kind of the context that you're bringing in terms of this question that we've been sort of exploring over the course of a, a number of different conferences really, which is there's this great set of uh, principles, you know, practices that's sort of a mix of levels that are included in the 12 factor uh, manifesto, if you will. And that's provided a great, you know, set of concrete ideas that folks can take as they're building applications and opinions that can be absorbed into technologies like Cloud Foundry to make it something where, great, we can now assume that if you're, you're building with these, we will make it really easy to run applications. So that's wonderful for the applications, but what about the data? And so can we, as a, an industry, arrive at a set of principles, concepts, that if we adhere to those, we can start to build the technologies around it to make it easy to scale your data and solve the types of data challenges that actually Dahlia introduced in quite a few of those if you were in the, the previous session. So that's kind of the, the, the context for everyone to say like, why am I interested in finding what that set of concepts and principles should be? Okay. So I'm Stephen O'Grady, I'm the co-founder of Redmonk. Uh, Redmonk, if you're not familiar with us, is a developer-focused industry analyst firm, or probably more uh, accurately for this particular audience, a practitioner-focused uh, industry analyst firm. As far as context, um, one of the things that I have found interesting, and I've written about this a number of times, is that you know in the late 90s and early parts of 2000s, I was a systems integrator, I was running around building enterprise systems. And you know a couple years ago, I looked around and sort of noticed that the way that we developed applications had changed radically. It looked nothing like uh, it did when I was building applications as an SI, but on the data side of the house, things really hadn't changed very much at all. Uh, you know, we still had many of the same tools, many of the same processes. That just didn't make a lot of sense to me. So, you know, basically, I've written about this a number of times. You know, we're beginning to have conversations with with folks like Pivotal and sort of a number of other sort of interested parties coming at it from different angles. Um, basically, just to, to ask the question, you know, what should data practices look like uh, in terms of, you know, building modern cloud native applications? So that's me. I'm Paul Puckett. Uh, I lead our application and development and platform architecture team for Federal for Pivotal. Uh, I come from uh, 10 years working in the federal space, uh, and really our focus is how we can guide our federal customers through this maturation process to really uh, leverage all you know, 12 factors of being cloud native. Uh, and when you're working with a lot of legacy systems, and, and normally systems that are mission critical or safety of life, um, the ability to just fundamentally change overnight uh, is really tough. And so uh, we work day in, day out, um, how we mature along that way, and some of the challenges of uh, what holds them back from really tapping into some of these great technologies, but also great opportunities that uh, if we buckle down and figure out with them that we can uh, really leverage. Hi, my name is Brian Dunlap. I'm a solution architect at Southwest Airlines. Uh, I'm helping us integrate all the things and all the places better. 
I have a background with operational data, which is a way of saying, here's stuff we need to help make decisions during the day. Hi, I'm Mark Ardito. Uh, I'm Vice President of Digital Delivery at HCSC, that's Healthcare Service Corporation. Um, we are the largest customer-owned health insurer in the United States, and we're the fourth largest health insurer overall. We operate Blue Cross Blue Shield of Illinois, Texas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, and Montana. Uh, we have a data problem. We have a lot of data. And so we have 15 million members. We process just north of 1 million claims a day. That's a lot of data, and we need to deal with it. Um, like they said earlier, we've transformed the way we build apps, but data kind of got left behind in that whole equation. So uh, we've been tackling that problem for uh, going on just over a year now and making headway towards that. Okay. So let's, let's figure out what we need to do to not leave data behind. No data left behind. Um, and we're going to, especially since it's the last session, we're going to have a little bit of fun. If you guys remember Linda Richmond, um, the Linda Richmond ske sketch from Saturday Night Live, you know, peanut. Is it a pea or a nut? Talk amongst yourselves. So we're going to be sort of rapid firing going through some things that I'll put out there is like, is it a factor? Talk amongst yourselves. So the first one we've got is data caching, right? So if you look at some of what Netflix has put out there in terms of, you know, caching is the secret microservice. Um, you know, is, uh, is thou shalt use a cache? Is it a facta? Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> I guess I got nominated. Um, I, I would say absolutely. I mean, I think one of the things that is characteristic of cloud native applications is that, again, is very, very different uh, than when I was building applications myself is that, you know, it used to be, you know, basically if you had a, uh, data problem, the answer was a relational database, always. Um, and that was basically all you'd use. You know, there were, there were roles for things, you know, hierarchical databases, uh, Berkeley DB was everywhere. And there were other things that would sort of be, be you know, sort of leveraged in specialized context. But by and large, 99% of the time, we we're talking about persistence, you're talking about relational databases, and that's it. And when you look around today, you know, certainly the, the challenges that the web scale has presented, uh, you know, introduce a, an entirely new class of problems. Uh, and you know, caching is is certainly a piece. It's one of many pieces uh, that has come to be, you know, essentially considered, you know, sort of mandatory. You know, depending on obviously on what you're doing, depending on your requirements. Uh, but certainly for you know a a class of cloud native applications, you know, you're, it's going to be really really difficult to get the, the performance that you want uh, at a certain scale. You know, without having some manner of of uh, you know essentially front end caching. And you know that just brings us back to the phrase that everybody's heard that there's only two two hard problems in computer science. Uh, one is naming products, and two is cache and validation. So it's necessary, but it's super super hard. So is it a factor? I would say yeah. Yeah, I think it's a factor. It's not the only one. I think it's definitely a factor that's there. Um, if you look at data stores like Hadoop and other things, where most organizations are throwing pretty much everything into Hadoop today, it's really tough to get things out of that really big thing, right? And so when we think about traditional um, schemas that people have made, it's I made the schema, I poured concrete on it, and let me know if you need to get that thing open. And it's a really big job to get that open and get the new things in it, but it's okay. And let's deal with those schemas, streaming them to caching layers. We can deal with them in cache mold them the way that we need to be them to be molded, to expose to APIs, to you know, start to get that out. And it can get the performance that we need. So, It's OK if we have a little fun? Uh, as long as the chairs stay okay. down. With respect to my panelists, no, it's not a factor. Oh. So I've got your factor right here. This is what I see with a lot of cloud talk. Dynamo, Kafka, caching. Like, so I'm gonna use a lot of 80s movies references. So with Ghostbusters, we, we can strap an unlicensed data accelerator onto our back and just start having at it, trying to capture whatever, right? So what I see is people thinking, here's the cloud, sign me up for Dynamo, Kafka, like caching. The X factor is the conversation around it so that caching isn't this magical thing and here are the trade-offs around it. Yeah, I mean, there are definitely some trade-offs, especially for Netflix, where 
um, you know, say you cache, you know, some user input or whatever, like you know, it gets lost. Like, oh, I liked this yesterday. I gave it four stars, and it says I didn't rate. Like, that's not that big of a deal. But if you talk about you know safety of life in some mission critical systems, like a lot of our federal customers are dealing with, if you've got a perhaps a stale cache and you've got perhaps some incorrect information, um, that could be a, a major issue when you talk about the world that they're living in. So. There are some situations where caching makes perfect sense for opportunity for users, but there are other times where you're going to have to find some other ways around it. I mean, for us, there's really it's it's a complete duplication of a database. We're not caching anything. We're shared like exact duplications because we can't afford to be wrong. Hmm. Okay, uh, would it be fair to say maybe there's some qualifications around how you handle cache and validation that that is the factor? Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm right there with you guys. It's a factor, but it's the only a factor for the right scenario, right? So I'm not gonna have a massive caching store for a system of record, right? Writing in and out of it, right? Mm -hmm. Just that's not applicable. But if I'm exposing APIs for an inquiry only type of approach, I need to expose claims, I need to expose membership data, product data, that's inquiry. Yes, caching makes total sense in that. And that is a good factor to have inside. Okay, so caching for inquiry. Can I, we maybe, yes. can we sort of boil it down to the bullet point there? Do you guys agree on caching for inquiry? Caching yeah. for inquiry? Mm. Yeah, I think that's. Mm. We'll come back to it, I don't know if I agree with that. <laughs> uh, okay, well we can move to the next one, data APIs. So in the last time we had this panel, uh, which was at Spring One Platform, and which, Brian is the only carryover member. There's, we're sort of like cycling through different, uh, different cast of characters each time. Um, it, so we talked about you know, how the, the DBA is kind of living on the other side of an API in terms of that relationship with developers. Um, so one of the things that I've been kind of noodling on is you know, should, should data teams be orienting around building the, the data, data API as their product, right? Taking a product mentality. And, and is that a factor? Could that be a factor? Uh, I think short answer is yes. Um, I think if you look at you know, some of the very, very high growth uh, platforms from the database standpoint or the managed database services from you know, sort of various uh, hyperscale providers, and effectively that's you know, essentially APIs. You know, all data via uh, an API. So basically, you know, even sort of taking a step back from that, if we think about how modern applications are being built, 12-factor applications are being built, you know, in large part they're being built and composed of services, right? And I use this example all the time. You know, most of us probably have smartphones. You know, if you think about the applications, you know, sort of in your, you know, on your smartphone in your pocket, you know, what are they? They're essentially wrappers around collections of services. They might do geo, they might do lookups to internal systems, um, you know, on and on and on. But you know, basically, you're taking a bunch of individual services, packaging them up, and boom, here's my application. And in many cases, data is just going to be another service that you're going to call on. So you know, in my view, again, there's exceptions. But in my view, yeah. And I think you know, to the extent that you can take your data uh, stores, whatever they might be, and expose them as a service, is something you absolutely should do. I agree. I think that when you start to have the person building the thing that's also exposing the thing that runs the thing, um, you get very good um, usage out of that. But it's it, it, back when we had operators and we had developers, operators were standing up middleware and infrastructure, developers were doing engineering, and we kind of um, had this lack of empathy, right? Mm -hmm. The operator was like, I don't know, man, I just stood the thing up. You just work on it. And the developer's like, that doesn't work. It's kind of like the old way of data of like, I made the model. How come you don't use it the way I designed it? It's like, well, it doesn't actually work. But when you, and I don't like the phrase, eat your own dog food, but if you drink your own champagne, I believe like you start to- I love to, champagne. Okay, good. Just so uh, you start to out. move forward and you get actual solutions that work for people mm -hmm. instead of designing things the way you think they're gonna be used. And so I think having data operators, DBAs, starting to expose APIs and or API people working on the data side um, starts to solve that. <laughs> well, it's, uh, I mean, it's, your last talk, kind of what you're poking at a few times is, you know, there's that question of do we need DBAs anymore, right? I mean, really product owners should be treating their data like a product, 
right? And so your DBA has really become a part of your team, you know, making sure that, that you're, you've got that stability and that, um, that relationship and that rapport. I mean, like you said in the last talk, they really become your, your reliability engineer, right? I mean, that's your, your, deep, your, your Dre, I believe it was, right? I mean, that's, that has to be the, the type of relationship. It's not so much where you've got a DBA that's the owner of the content, right? They're just kind of a little bit more of the custodian of the house, if you will, and really that product owner. Uh, so the product owner and their APIs that they're writing absolutely should be treated like that. Automation is a thing, including your infrastructure, including your data. Yes, I think it's a thing. Okay. All right. Well, actually, what, well, just one quick thing to add. You should all, if you haven't read this already, you should all read uh, Google, what is it, uh, Steve Yegge, uh, Y-E-G-G-E. -G -E. uh, if you just Google Steve Yegge rant, um, you'll have a very, very entertaining, long, um, essentially ran from him about the importance of services and how uh, Amazon, uh, in particular, got services religion. And it's as amusing as it is insightful. But basically, the, the notion is um, treat everything you can as a service. And otherwise, well, in that case, you get fired. But <laughs> that's a conversation for a different time. But yeah, Steve, Googly, uh, Steve Yaggy Google rant. I think uh, you'll find it entertaining. OK. Um, I'm sure everyone noted that. I can't find a pen in my backpack, so I'm just going to have to watch the replay. All right, um, event logs. So actually, we saw this in the talk right before this in terms of, you know, Dahlia was sort of illustrating how, uh, you know, you can, you, by, by using an event log, you can start to handle some of these cross-boundary transactions, et cetera. Um, so when done right, high volume logs give flexibility to add new unexpected services that can later become consumers, right, and, and catch up by replaying, given that the ordering is, is so strictly handled there. So is, given some of the challenges that Dahlia highlighted about, you know, how do you, as you move to a microservices architecture and you start to have these cross-boundary transactions, um, is, is having an event log a factor? Talk amongst yourselves. And it doesn't have to start with Steven, by the way. Yeah. Just putting that out there. <laughs> I didn't come up with this thought, but I sure like it. So I have glasses, and I need to get my prescription checked. All right, so I have some vision correction, talking point number one. Talking point number two is when you go to the eye doctor and there's an eye chart, there are the big letters at the top, and as you go down, Ugh, those little letters are kind of hard to see. All right, so the point, the analogy is, as we talk about immutability, event sourcing, a distributed immutable log, those are building blocks at certain abstractions on the eye chart. And as you go down, you're becoming more concrete. And I love that analogy. So does event sourcing solve stale reads, stale writes? No. Right, and people often think that it does, right? Does immutability help you in an event-based system spread your wings and scale? Yes, right? So what's tricky is we have to understand which abstractions we're looking at and building with as we choose which letters and which, letter, which levels on the eye chart to come up with like patterns and then concrete solutions. And I just so love that thought. So that's kind of how I would answer that. that. Yes, those are important letters. It doesn't mean I use them all the time. And it doesn't mean I use Kafka as a concrete implementation for a distributed immutable log all the time. Brian, you're, you're keeping, keeping things so complicated and nuanced here. I'm just trying to come but, up with 12, yeah, 12 things I know, to put on a but bullet I list. Do like, uh, I do like the eye chart example. Because well, like, as we go doctor. from talk to talk, like we get clues around um, like the, the any nines talk where he's talking about how do I automate data APIs? Mm -hmm. Here's a common letter called, am I about to run out of disk space? Right? Well, that letter exists regardless if you're doing that for Oracle or MySQL or whatever, or like as a concrete implementation. So I thought that was a good clue. Mm, okay. I yield the floor. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I take that point. I think one of the things that you know, to the question is, it, I mean, obviously it's important, obviously it's going to, to address uh, specific concerns, specific application concerns. I remember in the height of the financial crisis in 2008, 2009, uh, one of the banks is actually using its raw transactional logs from everything from ATMs to um, uh, essentially the web feed to make essentially real-time decisions in terms of 
oh, this person may be underwater, like, hey, we should probably reach out um, before they take all of their money out and banks crash. Um, so, you know, the net is, is that, you know, yes, we can do a lot with these things. They have not, at least historically, been essentially universally used. Um, you know, I mean, in other words, we still talk to some organizations where, you know, it's almost exhaust, right? That, I mean, sure, this is, you know, sort of outputting these event logs and we just don't do anything with it. Um, so, I mean, I guess one way to answer it would be, should it be a factor? Probably, um, because, you know, basically this is valuable information that can be repurposed in, a, you know, sort of a number of different ways. But I think we're quite a long ways away from everybody getting that religion, as it were. Okay. So like federal government's been using this for quite some time because we live in disconnected systems, especially in classification or you know, disconnected areas of the world. So for us, it's, it's one of the things that we have to rely on. So it's not a, a factor, if you will, or, or the factor, but for some situations, it's, it's really your only means, right? If you don't really have the opportunity to always have some persistent connection, even though you may be you know, you know, geographically regional separated, right? you sometimes don't even have a network connection in some of our classified uh, customer situations. So you've got to you've just do the delta, make sure the ordering's right, and, and get that done. Now, Mark? I think it's uh, inside the 12 factor, there are some things that are just common sense. Uh, we look at them today and we kind of roll our eyes like, well, duh, we all do those things. Right. I think in my mind, uh, event here in this case is one of those things where why aren't we all just doing this? So I'm not sure if it has to be a factor. Um, I think we all should be doing it. Uh, more comments, Brian? Event sourcing is really hard, so go test that. And like, here's the 18 bazillion different test preconditions that can get you into an out of, out of order, funky state. It's non-trivial. So, um, it's not a golden hammer. And I would say be careful to only use it where it provides business advantage. But uh, is the question was actually event logs, right? So, you know, when in the context of a number of other factors, this isn't saying like this is the golden hammer that's gonna solve everything, but this is on a list of things that you should do that should set up an architecture that allow you to flexibly add services down the line. Now you need to balance it with other practices that help with things like stale data, right? And help with things like in the caching situation that we talked about before, you know, again, invalidated data in the cache. So you need to balance it. But is this something that to Mark's point should just be kind of one of those obvious like, well, like obviously we should be using a shared code repository. Um, but you know, if you go back 20 years, like not everyone was doing that. So it seems kind of like, duh, now. But if we were to fast forward and just say, well, this should just be everywhere. It doesn't solve everything. You need to know what it solves for. But it provides a useful construct in order to be able to solve a number of different challenges that emerge in a cloud-native architecture. I think it's a party trick that can help save you. And I think a good clue is go find your data warehouse friends and they have party tricks that save themselves on being able to rebuild tables and they may have the equivalent of the immutable log that they've saved with their tables that they don't share with people mm -hmm. so that they can go recreate uh, the shared tables when things go wrong. So like these clues and these patterns have been out there maybe in the traditional data warehousing environment and I think those patterns will live on regardless of where we run our stuff. Mm. Just time check. Okay. Um, all right. Dumb storage. Uh, so I'm seeing folks starting to do some interesting things by sort of abstracting the data management away from like a really dumb storage later. So almost kind of moving some more into a, 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 a middle layer, a, a metadata management layer. So. Uh, this obviously might run into limitations in places, but is that something that could be a factor? It's how you treat your storage. I know this kind of pertains a little bit to. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I take the point, and certainly you do see people doing very creative and mitigates very dangerous things, um, you know, with, with dumb storage. 
I don't know that I would. Ex- I don't know that I would say it's a factor. Um, you know, I think that there are a lot of different ways to. You know, as we talked about before, there's such a diversity of data stores now, and such a diversity of the way those data stores are managed, implemented, um, and you know, persist the data themselves. That I don't think. You know, I'm trying to think of cases where I would say, if not universally, something close to universally, this is how you would sort of do this, and this is an important uh, thing that basically must be in almost every cloud native app. Um, you know, it could be that I'm just sort of missing an obvious use case, but you know, apart from, like I said, you know, the, the things that we see are, you know, sort of interesting, but they're almost interesting because you know some of the usage is novel, right? Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I'd have a tough time saying making the argument that this should be a legit near universal factor. I think. Hmm. I don't know if anybody disagrees. Seems some nodding heads on the stage. <laughs> Okay, so, right. so not say, a factor. You say no. You want to say yes? I want to say yes. Oh. All right. So uh, Southwest is talking with AWS, and when they come to town, they show S3 as the middle of their universe, right? Big dumb S3 storage, which is a very important choice if you'd ever like to maybe run not on AWS, right? So it's kind of like, yes, it's a huge thought on do you have Hadoop as a unifying multi cloud, multi presence thing or not? So, yes, I think it's a huge choice. And I think the economics of all that, too, like here's what you're going to live with for the next long time, is a significant thought for cloud native data. Interessante. Okay. Schemas. <laughs> so um, I actually get I'm kind of like really excited to answer the schema. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. That's it. Well, what was your question? If you move any further forward on that chair, I've got hot you're sports gonna be opinions on schemas on the floor. Okay. Um, so not defining a scheme up front would provide so much flexibility, but um, is there a scenario when starting from scratch that you would want to define a schema, or could we say not defining a schema on right is a factor? No, go ahead. This is your hot take. Yeah. <laughs> go ahead. Okay. I, I'm going to just unleash some rage. Is that okay? A little bit? I think All right, within, so, within okay, reason. Okay, yes. So uh, <laughs> distributed applications are made up through distributed teams. And here's all the right guardrails, all the right boundaries for security, common practices, and simple things that will make your life way easier. And I'm going to pick on a really simple use case. Let's standardize our date time formats so that when I go try to unify domains A, B, C, D, E, it's not different, 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 different. And we're just talking big dumb date time formats. Yeah. Right, so that's an easy example of, yes, to simplify threading the needle for us to join across those domains, I would like some sort of boundary that enforces that as we move into new turf for cloud native places. Yeah, I think, uh, I, I think I'm actually largely in agreement with that. I think the, you know, the interesting thing to me is, is that if you watch the evolution of the, the quote unquote no SQL market, which was a term I thought was dumb at the time, I think it still is, uh, it's become even dumber because most of the, you know, uh, databases that have been classified that way have actually gone back and added query languages, but we'll leave that aside. Uh, you know, I think one of the interesting things is that a lot, you know, a lot of the promise and a lot of the reasons for adoption for many, many of these data stores was the fact that they were schemaless. You could basically, you know, get going and start, you know, throwing things in and out of it. Uh, and really what you see from, you know, from, uh, you know, sort of a number of adopters is that they eventually hit a wall where, you know, hey, this seemed like a good idea, but now it's actually causing me more problems than it's solving. So, you know, look, we need some, you know, some guidance, some rules, you know, some, some structure, uh, you know, to ensure consistency across uh, particularly organizational boundaries. So, yeah, I think I agree with that. Okay. Um, I think we're mostly out of time, uh, but since we got started a minute late, I'm going to do my last question. So test integration. Writing and automating tests is critical for cloud native speeds. You know, if you've listened to any of the talks here today, lots of love for, you know, being able to automate those tests, right? 
Um, so what does that look like at the database layer? In this case, I don't necessarily have a like, blah, is it a factor for you? We'll just sort of close on you know, thoughts and comments on what, what does that mean and look like in order to make sure that we don't slow down those pipelines. What can we be doing at the data layer to make sure those pipelines can continue to flow? Uh, I think one of the things that, that I've seen, at least, uh, in terms of you know, talking to, to users, talking to, to vendors as well, is you know, going back to what we talked about at the, at the top, right? The fact that you know, the way that we manage data within organizations is, needs to change. And part of that is, is essentially testing, right? Um, you know, because we're beginning to do very, very different things with data sources. Uh, so you have all sorts of new problems in terms of you know, everything from cache invalidation that we talked about, you know, but in many cases to things like privacy concerns, right? You know, if you go back, I can't remember what year it was, um, uh, a couple of the airlines got in trouble because they essentially were supplying uh, the TSA with data to test some TSA systems, and that data was not managed or handled properly, and there were you know, essentially leaks and intrusions and so on. So um, anyway, there's a whole range of things that from a test perspective, you, know, you want to ensure that you know, the integrity of data is sound you know, from process to process, data store to data store, uh, but also sort of as you move along that, hey, we need to test to make sure that this is being treated and handled properly as well. So yeah, I'm, you know, there's I think a, a huge spectrum of, of aspects here, you know, to testing. But you know, to me, this is one of the areas where uh, we really need to see a lot of evolution. You know? So it, it reminds me, honestly, of Molly's keynote about pulling kind of like making security everyone's job and sort of the process of shifting security left. Here you're really talking about kind of the data governance side of things and how do you make data governance really part of everyone's job. Right. Uh, and so that that's, those tests get written because the development team is really taking more ownership of the data governance for all the data that their application is touching. Exactly right. Any other comments? Yeah, I mean if you're, testing and development can be absolutely anywhere. Right? I mean, if you're changing a write function, you should be writing a, a read test first to make sure that you're getting what you want. I mean, and vice versa. One of our good friends did a, a compliance-driven development uh, presentation at Spring One last year, uh, where essentially he was validating his configuration of his entire Postgres database for purposes in the federal government of security accreditation. Uh, it's just accelerating you know, confidence in, in what we're going to be using, again, to getting that uh, database reliability engineer right part of our team. So absolutely. I think we need a set of eye chart abstractions that are very unclear right now for concrete things on test data management. So PII, who can see what, data governance, data flow, resetting, automation, APIs, like how do you go automate all of that? A whole set of conversations that need to be flushed out to help with that. Yeah, I agree. Test automation has to be there. I, it's a factor. Yeah, it has to be. Okay. All right, now I know we've run out of time. Thank you, gentlemen, each of you, for participating in the panel. Thank you, audience, for uh, participating with your presence.